Welcome, everybody, to the 2008 College of Engineering Distinguished Lecturer. This is a lecture series that celebrates the high impact research in engineering and that annually honors one of our faculty engaged in outstanding research. This is really a showcase event for the public and to allow the members of the university community to meet a distinguished scholar selected by the College of Engineering faculty to discuss a topic of extreme relevance to society. This year's distinguished lecturer is John Balio. Let me give you half an hour overview of his background. <laughs> he thinks I'm kidding. John holds professional appointments in three different departments at BU. Aerospace Mechanical Engineering, Electrical and Computer Engineering, and Manufacturing Engineering. He is the past chairman of Aerospace Mechanical, past chairman of, the, of Manufacturing, and he has served as Associate Dean for Academic Programs at Boston University's College of Engineering. <laughs> uh, Professor Balliol currently serves as Editor-in-Chief for the SIAM Journal of Control and Optimization and is on the editorial boards for the Proceedings of the IEEE, the IEEE Transactions and Automatic Control, Communications and Information and Systems, and the Journal of Robotics and Computer Integrated Manufacturing. He has been named a fellow of the IEEE for his contributions to nonlinear control theory, robotics, and the control of complex mechanical systems. He is a recent recipient of the IEEE Third Millennium Medal for various professional contributions. Dr. Balliol is the IEEE Vice President of Publication Services and Products, and thereby gained a seat on the Board of Directors of the entire IEEE for 2007, which is the world's largest professional organization, nearly 400,000 people and its publishing is over a $130 million business. After achieving his PhD from Harvard University, he joined the mathematics department of Georgetown University. And during the academic year 83-84, he was the Vinton Hayes Visiting Scientist in Robotics at Harvard University. In 91, a visiting scientist in the Department of Electrical Engineering at MIT. John has been an active member of the IEEE and Control Systems Society for many years. And in 84 through 85, he was the associate editor of Transactions about Automatic Control. And in 87, served on the prog as program chairman of the IEEE Conference on Decision and Control in LA. He, is, he was editor in chief of IEEE Transactions and Automatic Control for six years. Some additional professional accomplishments. He has served now on over 14 separate editorial boards of top tier journals. He has supervised over 17 PhD student recipients at Boston University. He's edited two books. He's authored, authored 134 peer-reviewed scientific publications. Between 2001 and now, he has been PI or co-PI on well over $15 million in extramural funding, including two Murray grants. Since 1998, he has given 59 invited talks throughout the world, several of which on, of, he's been the keynote or plenary speaker. Today, of course, he agreed to give his best ever invited talk. So, please join me in welcoming the inaugural annual College of Engineering Distinguished Lecturer, John Balliol. Yes. Okay, thanks very much, Ken, and uh, thanks to you and to Selim and whoever else was uh, responsible for this uh, high honor. Uh, I will uh, give it my uh, best shot. Um, this is a, a uh, lecture that is uh, similar to uh, a couple others that I've given in the last year. Um, I quote my uh, late colleague, uh, Leo Felsen, that says, if you're around long enough, these things catch up with you. <laughs> and um, uh, so I'm going to try to, to uh, uh, talk a little bit about some of the things that have been important to a number of us uh, in the field. and. Uh, you know, ordinarily, uh, one needs to respect the uh, saying that, that every time you put up an equation, you lose half your audience. Uh, I'm going to assume that this is a very sophisticated audience. So while I think there is a discount factor, and I'll try to keep equations to the minimum, um, there will be a couple. So this is a uh, story uh, that, that um, um, involves quite a number of people, and, and this is uh, a uh, recent, uh, not the most recent, but a recent picture of uh, 
colleagues and students in my lab, uh, and I've been very fortunate to have some great students here. And uh, I've been uh, spending uh, sabbatical, uh, a lot of it in Hong Kong. Uh, most people don't realize that Hong Kong is about, uh, although it's a great uh, Asian uh, urban center, it also, about 90% of it is wilderness, and, and this is atop of what's called uh, Sharp Peak with a bunch of Chinese graduate students. So uh, this is a story that, that is a little bit about Boston University. And uh, Boston University uh, is, has become a, a, a rather uh, uh, fine and distinguished place, uh, but it, it uh, came from fairly uh, humble origins. And before the 1970s, um, it was working its way uh, from something that was just a vocational school into something that became an accredited college of engineering for the first time in 1973. And uh, with Ken here, and uh, I don't know, is, is Lou here? No, not Lou. Um, and, and David Campbell? No, anyway, with Ken and, and uh, Merrill, there, there's a couple of people who have uh, um, been deans here, and there were, uh, and Charles, I want to uh, point out that, that uh, there were three deans that were presiding over the place during a period of phenomenal growth. And the man on the left here is uh, uh, Art um, Thompson, who was a dean that was hired by Harold Case, who's the president of Boston University on the right. And uh, Art uh, um, sort of invented the College of Engineering, and uh, it was so named in 1963. And it was launched with three programs, uh, aeronautical engineering, which had been part of the, uh, this little vocational school that had been here before that, and uh, manufacturing and systems engineering. And, and uh, Merrill uh, was hired by Art, uh, Merrill sitting in the back, uh, and was chairman of manufacturing engineering, which was an invention of something of, of, at Boston University. Uh, there was no manufacturing engineering anywhere else in the world. Lou Padulo is uh, the dean who hired me, and Lou um, actually was probably the first person to bring control to BU in a serious way. Lou was trained as an electrical engineer, and, and um, he spent the first year uh, uh, in 1974 that he was here working with uh, Michael Arbib at Stanford to get out a book on linear systems, and that book is, uh, there's still two copies in the library. But Lou knew uh, uh, people in the control community, and, and it was natural that, that uh, um, he went out and, and tried to bring some of them here. And then, of course, I, was, I, you know, I had all sorts of uh, um, funny gag lines about the guy on the right, uh, uh, the, the guy on the far right, uh, uh, who, who uh, but now it's looking like it's still a bit uncertain that, that uh, he actually may be the first gentleman of the United States, and, and he is passing along one of Charles's many honors here to him. Uh, and Charles was, was the third of, of uh, a set of deans between um, the uh, 2000, essentially 1970 and 2000, that, that really uh, uh, took this place from being a vocational school to being a first-rate research university. So Charles reminded me um, that uh, th there were uh, previous uh, speakers who had outrageous titles to their talks, and um, one of them was uh, this guy. This is Irvin Schr Schrodinger, and Schrodinger uh, gave a talk in uh, Dublin in 1943. Uh, Schrodinger was recruited by uh, no less than the first prime, uh, prime minister of uh, Ireland, Eamon de Valera, who established something called the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies. And part of the charter of the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies was that there had to be a series of, of public lectures. So um, uh, uh, Schrodinger uh, was willing to step up to the plate, and he was working at the time on some variational principles in physics, but uh, like Charles uh, DeLisi, he was a bit of a polymath, and he was willing to step outside his, his comfort zone, and so he gave a series of three lectures uh, that were called What is Life? And uh, he was not a biologist, and, and um, 
uh, was uh, probably naive, even by the uh, standards of, of what was understood in biology at the time. But it's interesting to see what, what a really brilliant mind can come up with when they step outside of their comfort zone. Because despite the fact that, that uh, they may not have you know, all of the, the technical details of, of the latest advances in the field, they're still very creative. And um, it's really quite a wonderful book that grew out of this. Um, and it's, it's still in print in Cambridge University Press. And uh, just uh, to note uh, some of the interesting things is that, that he, he knew what chromosomes were, and he was aware of research in his own community that had produced um, uh, mutations by irradiating certain parts of chromosomes. And so he talked of the, these things as being aperiodic crystals. And he had sort of the, the uh, ideas uh, that, that uh, there were things called genes that were parts of the chromosomes or pieces in these aperiodic crystals that had to do with, with biological expression. So he, the, the book uh, deals a lot with um, sort of statistical mechanics and, and how uh, expression can be preserved and stable uh, according to his understanding. And it, it's, it's really a wonderful, uh, wonderful book. And it was very influential, by the way, in, in Watson and Crick and people like that who were students at the time who, who got a hold of the book and, and really chose their career path. So another one, um, this I just thought was uh, uh, funny because it has the same title. And, and this, uh, I would say, is probably not quite as, as uh, wonderful a book, but it's, it's uh, interesting. Uh, it it uh, admits at the very beginning that it is uh, kind of a, uh, the title is a ripoff of, of Schrodinger. Uh, and it's also interesting that um, Lynn Margulis was a professor here and gave the university lecture in 1978. So this is also a talk about uh, uh, control theory at BU. And uh, this is a little bit of the menu. And I I will uh, try to touch on each one of these points and, and say a little bit about what I think some of the important uh, aspects of, of what I do and what a number of my colleagues do um, and, and how this has uh, evolved at, at BU. Um, one of the things that I think is, is uh, quite interesting is that, that BU has, uh, over the time that I've been here, invested a lot in this area. And the question is, um, that one might ask, is has this uh, paid off? And I think that it is fair to say that, that uh, BU is a place that is recognized around the world. Um, my colleague uh, David Castanon, who uh, can't be here today, who is uh, uh, the chairman ad interim, uh, an interim may go on for a while it looks like, um, of uh, the electrical and computer engineering department is also currently sitting as the 42nd president of the IEEE Control System Society. And uh, Christos, who I think is probably not in the audience because he broke his leg, um, but uh, is the editor-in-chief of the IEEE Transactions and Automatic Control. And um, it is the case that there are about uh, 10 or so top journals in control engineering it turns out that two of them are here at BU. And uh, while I think it's fair to say that the transactions and automatic control has always been regarded by most people as the top journal in the world, um, it is, according to the uh, 2006 uh, JCR reports, the top electrical engineering journal out of the 206 that they track uh, in terms of the uh, total number of citations its pages. So let me talk a little bit about what, what it is that uh, all of us do that, that seems to uh, um, be cited. Um, and what is control? And I'm going to quote uh, a number of things that one of our uh, leading lights, uh, Carl Johan Ostrom from uh, Sweden, uh, has uh, brought out, that it's a hidden technology. It's really part of almost everything that, that we get involved with in terms of technology in our lives. Whenever you get onto an airplane, there are, um, to use a technical term, a zillion components that have to function together in, in a complex choreographed activity to keep the plane airborne and to do all of the things that it needs to do. Um, 
it's uh, very successful. Things work. Uh, air travel is uh, the safest form of travel uh, because it works so well. But it's certainly seldom talked about. Uh, people uh, don't uh, uh, talk about um, um, being interested in control in the same way that they talk about being interested in computers. And one of the reasons is that it is easier to discuss devices uh, than it is to discuss ideas. But here's an example of, an, of uh, another example of a very uh, complex uh, control system. This is uh, one of the larger components at uh, CERN, which is uh, about to come online. That's a man standing there, so this is actually a rather large component. And if you see uh, a diagram of this thing, uh, this uh, uh, particle accelerator is something that's 27 kilometers in, in circumference. And what it does is um, this is designed to uh, conduct high energy physics experiments. And what's involved is that you send a beam of photons, of uh, protons rather, uh, going in counter veiling directions around the circumference of this thing, and they are supposed to collide with one another at uh, um, near light speed, and this is, uh, uh, this is, uh, produces um, very high energy collisions, and all sorts of things that are interesting to physicists happen. But the, the, this is also interesting because it's, it's a huge uh, sort of experimental test bed for everything that we know about control systems. And there are all sorts of dif different systems with different time constants. And I'll come back to time constants in different places in the talk. But um, one of the things that they have to do in order to make this work is they have to cool it down to um, uh, almost zero degrees Kelvin, which is an unimaginably low temperature. And look at how big this thing is. And in order to do that in a way that, that the uh, um, components don't shatter, is that you have to cool it down very, very quickly. And in fact, it takes uh, about six months to uh, cool it down. And it has to be done in a very careful, regulated way where there's constant feedback and, and you just gradually lower the temperature. Then, once it's cool, um, what you do is you get ready to conduct your experiment. And here now, the time constants are nanosecond time constants. And what you have to do is you have to keep this beam very tightly focused. Because if, if you don't keep the beam focused, the uh, protons wander off and they collide into the side of the, uh, um, of the chambers. Uh, they can cause damage. And they certainly uh, dissipate in energy. So you don't get the high energy collisions that you need. So there are all of these, these active control systems that are working. And uh, the interesting thing is that, that um, uh, although everything that we've done uh, in the field is uh, playing a role here, uh, any public lecture you hear about this, especially by uh, people from physics, is, is, uh, doesn't talk about it. Where else do you see it? Well, um, there's a couple of mood pieces here. This is a, uh, the Maxwell uh, a Flyball Governor, which uh, uh, most uh, basic control uh, courses uh, talk about. And this works by regulating the flow of steam uh, um, based on opening and closing a valve, uh, uh, depending on how fast this thing is spinning around and the centrifugal forces are forcing the ball out. This is uh, the switch on the dashboard of a car uh, for the electric, electronic stability program. And this uh, really touches on where the title of the talk uh, um, comes in, in that um, most cars now have this uh, network of sensors and actuators that sense uh, pitch and yaw and different uh, uh, motions of the car. And they compare the motion as it's sensed with what you, you can, um, the, what, what the car knows about itself in terms of, of steering and braking, uh, the controls that are being activated. And if the system senses that the car is doing something uh, th that has a physical response that's different from what people or are, are the driver wants it to have, it will uh, apply corrective action. And this works incredibly well. And one of the things that, that, that is actually, I think, uh, quite unsafe is for people who are accustomed to driving cars that have ESP 
to go back to driving the old-fashioned car and, uh, because it, 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 it doesn't uh, cover your back. So uh, again, quoting Carl Johan, uh, this is uh, just a, uh, uh, an amazing system. Um, and uh, it, it's really made a big difference in, in driving safety. So the position of control is a discipline. It is respected. Um, it's coupled to a vast array of engineered systems, but it lacks uh, a distinct identity, and it lacks an in identifiable industrial base, uh, as, as I said before. I mean, we don't think of it in the same sense that we think about uh, um, what you can do with computers or mobile communication devices. So a brief history of the field. Um, you know, you can trace the origin, the intellectual origins back for centuries, but uh, um, uh, most modern control, I think, traces back to uh, a lot of the development in the early half of the uh, 20th century uh, that had to do with telecommunications. And what you find is that a lot of the uh, uh, things that people refer to as seminal papers uh, came out of uh, Bell Labs. And uh, um, uh, that was, uh, I think, um, one of the great, uh, great American institutions that unfortunately is not uh, what it once was. Um, there was a second wave of control um, that uh, uh, kind of really hit the scene around 1960 with um, recursive estimation, sometimes goes by the name of Kalman filtering, and the maximum principle, which is a, a, just a huge and, and uh, profound uh, um, idea of um, the way that you design processes uh, to work in an optimal way, and, and uh, uh, Larry Ho, who's sitting in the front row here has one of the great books that, that I believe is still in print. It's, it's uh, after many years. So it was, uh, it's, an, it's an old book. It, it dates almost back to this period, and, and uh, it's still going strong. So uh. the third wave is, is uh, there's been sort of a huge uh, I I expansion of the field. And I think one of the things it's fair to say is, is as much as any uh, um, of the uh, engineering disciplines and, and uh, fields in general that I'm aware of, is that uh, control has, has managed to um, in, uh, find new ways to apply abstraction to technological problems. And I think it's been a, a huge uh, um, uh, source of, of uh, um, advancement in the field. And, you know, understanding uh, um, um, how you, you um, involve now uh, communications technologies and information technologies uh, combined with, with what you know about the um, dynamic response of physical systems has meant that it's, it's really stayed very vital and uh, um, uh, funding has been pretty good over many, many years. So the next wave, uh, that's what I want to talk about now and, and where things are. And uh, this is a little bit of a mood piece that, that sets uh, some of the things that, that uh, motivate all of us uh, who are in this business. Um, and that is, uh, you know, a lot of this technology is driven by uh, what uh, the U.S. Department of Defense thinks is, is important in terms of new technologies. And there's a mandate, a government mandate, that by 2015, one-third of all deployed military vehicles will be autonomous. This is actually quite a terrifying thing to think about um, if you think about the state of where we are now, because it's, it's one thing to have uh, um, ABS and uh, uh, ESP in your car, and it's another thing to think about your car um, um, driving in from home to pick you up and then driving you home, which is, is effectively what's being asked for here. Um, Another aspect of, of this that's, uh, I think, uh, motivated us, uh, a number of us, to think about new things is that um, uh, one has to th rethink human factors um, when you talk about giving machines a lot more autonomy, because it means that, that we're going to have different relationships with machines than we've had in the past. And um, one of the things that, that we're currently involved in is a... Uh, uh, Murray uh, on the behavioral dynamics of cooperative control where you have uh, mixed teams of, of humans and robots and, and how you partition tasks and get them to efficiently and effectively work together as teams.
so this is an example of a, of a robot. Uh, this is a uh, pilotless aircraft. Uh, military is very interested in deploying these. Uh, they've been in the news enormous amount over the last decade. So this is an example of a, uh, an underwater robot, and uh, some of the uh, work that we're doing with, with colleagues at Princeton uh, uses a whole squadron of these, and they go out and they map um, thermal gradients in the ocean. Uh, they also use them to do uh, uh, autonomous whale watching and, and uh, kind of keep track of, of, of what whales do when they're out of sight of human beings. And this is just a couple of uh, robots in the lab that are wandering around the corridor. Uh, we try to do this uh, during school vacation so that uh, uh, nobody gets uh, confused about uh, what they're supposed to do and if they see these things coming. Okay, so uh, here's one of those uh, autonomous aircraft. And this is uh, kind of the uh, state of where we are now, that, that there are a bunch of these that are deployed. Some of them have been uh, fairly successful. They're not totally autonomous for the most part yet, but but uh, autonomy is coming. And I said that we went from science to science fiction. The reason this is science fiction is because when you have two of them, uh, we're really beyond the state of, of what we know how to, to uh, safely and effectively control today. So having squadrons of these that actually do things in a cooperative way, that, I mean serious things, I don't mean like in, in the lab, because everybody's got demos of robots walking around in the lab. but, but uh, uh, having these uh, fly in close uh, um, uh, uh, proximity in, in uh, serious military missions is, is beyond the state of the art. So let me talk about uh, several different uh, concepts of, of network control systems. Uh, classical control, as uh, many of the people in this room learned it, is, uh, uh, involves uh, plants and, and controllers, and you have a feedback loop, and what you do is you measure your output, like the rate at which steam is escaping from a valve, and you have a controller, which could be just a simple flyball governor, and that regulates the flow of speed. And you can do the same thing with various electronic circuits, and, and a lot of classical feedback design, as I said, you know, came out of uh, electrical engineering and communications engineering, so this is a very natural way to think about these things. But the way people have started thinking about these things uh, in the last uh, 20 years or so is that you may have a plant which is a very complicated complicated physical process, you have a bunch of sensors which you, you uh, multiplex together, their output, and you interpret the signal you get from the multiplexer, and then you put signals out through a router, and, and uh, depending on, on uh, how you want to amplify those signals, these uh, um, affect the plant. And uh, somehow this is, this is an old slide that I made about uh, uh, 10 years ago. I think it, it ended up in the uh, logo for SICE. So, Network control systems, um, if you had to give a date when it first uh, kind of uh, hit the street, it would be 1983, and uh, one of the big automotive countries in Stutt companies in Stuttgart, uh, Bosch, um, realized that, that the way cars were going to work in the future is that they were going to have to, to uh, be thought of as having network systems that somehow were choreographed to work uh, together. And so they, they had a working group uh, that they put together, and in 1986, I believe it was, they uh, announced their um, CAN protocol. And uh, this is the control area network, and this is now a standard technology in all automotive systems. And I think that the thing that really made uh, network control systems take off is the communication technologies that um, developed in the... Uh, um, in the 1990s, and people just became very, very interested in what you could do by having all of these little digital components that, that were scattered around talk to each other in real time, and, uh, um, and could you somehow get things to play together in ways that, that um, were, were uh, um, uh, more effective than just having things that operated independently. So there, there's quite a number of things that, that uh, come up when you start to think about um, networking 
control systems using uh, different communications technologies. These are um, uh, actual photographs of uh, Bluetooth radios. And a lot of people know what Bluetooth is because you've got now, you've got uh, headpieces for your cell phone if, if you don't mind plugging into things um, to charge them. And um, they, they talk to each other. It's just a low power uh, packet switch radio device. And uh, Bluetooth is in a lot of things. It's in my laptop, and, and uh, um, they, they, you have Bluetooth in your cars sometimes. The, um, uh, this is a uh, protocol, and we got one of the early uh, um, development kits. And what's uh, kind of neat about it is that it's a very open architecture, and so you can design uh, uh, packets. You can load them up with data uh, however you want within the uh, scope of, of the protocol. And um, we did some uh, early experiments on this uh, balancing an inverted pendulum. And inverted pendulums, I want you to think about uh, this as a, as a prototypical problem because it's, it's a way to think about what, what uh, control people do. Uh, think about, I, I didn't bring it with me, and I, I, I'm glad because I'd embarrass myself, but you can think about me standing here with an inverted broom in my hand and just trying to balance it. And, you know, if you practice that long enough, uh, um, you can actually get good at it. And, uh, but the thing is that, that you have to pay attention because if you don't uh, um, keep moving uh, to, to correct it when it starts to fall over, it falls over. So this is a, a sort of a prototypical unstable system. And so I want everybody to think about, about what, what it means to be unstable. It means the broom is going to fall over if you try to balance it in your hand. So... Um, uh, before I say more about that, here's a little robot, and it's, it's going around on the right here. Um, this is another um, uh, communication device. This is, this is called a moat. All right. Moats are, are uh, one of the uh, standard technologies. It's an open ec architecture technology. So if you want to build what's called a sensor net, and this is kind of a, a, a hot topic in, in a lot of what uh, people do these days, uh, you can get these moats, and they're uh, digital packet-switched uh, low-power radio communication devices. And typically, they have sensors that come on them. But uh, but uh, uh, the I think the thing that's that's got most people interested is not the sensors per se, but the uh, the uh, RF uh, communication technologies. So one of the things that's characteristic of both Bluetooth and and this is that they're low power and they're relatively low bandwidth. So if you want to have this little robot do something that is, 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 um, depends on communicating very fast with other little robots, uh, you're going to get up against some, some very hard limits about how much information you can press uh, through this radio communications channel. And this is, is something that, that uh, is, is one of the uh, basic challenges in understanding uh, network control systems is how you deal with communication bandwidth in terms of sort of physical objectives that you'd like to realize. So um, let me, uh, uh, I'm going to point out a few uh, references, uh, um, and uh, if, if people are interested, they can uh, um, talk to me. But I think this is... Um, maybe the most important paper of, of, the, uh, of the 1990s. And it's uh, called System with Finite Communication Bandwidth Constraints. And what it, it talks about is it talks about the idea of having one of those classical control systems that I put up in the diagram where you've got a plant and a controller and a feedback loop. And let's suppose that the feedback channel is, is a highly constrained communication channel, which means that, that you can only squeeze so many bits per second through that channel. And the question is, um, what can you do in terms of, of physical performance of a closed loop feedback control system uh, if you have that kind of a setup? This was a, an important paper because it, it framed the question more or less in that way. And it talked about um, um, a coding scheme called um, um, prefix coding uh, for feedback signals, and it, it dealt with uh, things called craft inequalities and things like that. And I don't want to bore you with the details, uh, uh, although they're, it's pretty interesting to read. It, it's a very simple paper, and what it does is it takes this communication protocol and it shows how it has to be shaped in order to be able to stabilize an unstable system like the, the broom that I talked about. 
And people were interested in sort of connections between feedback control and communication for many, many years. And people were interested. There were a lot of papers um, between the 1960 and, and the uh, 1990s written on, you know, what happens to uh, Kalman filters uh, if the, uh, you don't have the right types of information, what happens to extended Kalman filters where you can have problems with, with the uh, uh, covariance uh, uh, not being really the appropriate size of the process. And people sort of struggle to understand how information and, and control uh, play together. But, but what this paper did is it, it really framed the question in a way that nobody had thought about it before. And so this has led to a lot of things. And one of the things um, that uh, we were involved in here uh, that, that kind of grew out of that is the data rate theorem. And this is a, a simple to state. And, and um, I'll interpret the equation here for you. I apologize for the equation. But what it says is that there is a critical data rate if you have a feedback system. And what that is is it's just a, the sum of the real parts of the right half plane poles, and I'll tell you what those mean in a minute. And the system can be stabilized in a feedback loop uh, if and only if the channel capacity is larger than this critical capacity. So this is quite an interesting thing because it, it and it, it's sort of intuitively appealing because what it says is it says that the time constants of the system and the data rate that you have to communicate through a feedback loop are really very closely related. And, and the, the, uh, when I talk about right half plane poles here, what, what those measure is if you take something like the broom example, it measures how fast the broom's going to fall over. And it turns out that, that brooms will, will fall over more quickly, depending on how long they are. And if you have a very short pendulum like this, it's almost impossible. In fact, uh, I doubt that, that anyone in the room, unless you're a professional juggler, could stabilize my, my laser pointer in your hand. Because the time constants just get, get shorter and shorter as the, as the thing gets shorter. And what this says is that, that then if you had a very short inverted pendulum, for whatever reason you wanted to balance, then um, you would have to have a very high channel capacity in the feedback loop. And this, uh, just some names here, this has been proved under lots of different assumptions. This is really kind of an interesting connection between information processing on the one hand and physics, on the other hand. And there's some interesting consequences of this. Uh, one of them is that um, in an ideal setting, um, what it turns out is that in order to stabilize an unstable system, and you can think of the inverted pendulum, you can think about a pendulum on a cart, you can think about a rocket that has to take off vertically, you can think about, uh, for people who do aerospace systems, uh, you can think a, uh, of a, of a uh, of a, a high-performance aircraft that has a canard control, that is, uh, controlled by control surfaces that are up in the nose of the plane. The only thing that matters, it turns out, is the data rate. It doesn't matter how much force you can apply, even for a very big pendulum. The thing is that you can, you can stably control this, provided you can give little jerks one way or the other at a sufficiently high rate. And they only have to be, it only has to be one bit coding, uh, which is also interesting. So this is just some more um, um, references. I think uh, I won't uh, um, spend a lot of time on that. Um, one of the things that we have done is we, we've, um, um, I, I think that a lot of this uh, network control and information-based control, which I would call it, um, is just getting to the, the uh, point of maturity where some monographs uh, will be appropriate. But uh, we've done a lot of special issues, and, and other people have too. And uh, looked at, at uh, different questions um, uh, that involve coding. And uh, this is, I think, one of the great open questions because uh, a lot of, of communication engineering and information theory has been devoted to how you design uh, effective codes that, that achieve uh, the uh, Shannon channel capacity reliably. And, and this has been sort of a central focus. And it turns out that the focus, when you, when you talk about, uh, instead of uh, talking on your cell phone, you talk about things like, uh, um, uh, you know, stable control of systems, that the requirements are, are, are rather different. And uh, you, you need to uh, think about codes in a different way. So um, it, it's clear that, I, you know, I'm going to have to uh, limit what I say. But I do want to talk a little bit about um, 
where all of this uh, might be leading. And um, if you talk about communication control and information-enabled control systems, then it turns out that, that you have to be thinking about things like noise, bit error, and risk. And I like to think about risk in terms of, of uh, systems that, that eventually uh, will fail to operate um, in the way that you hope, or that something will happen that, that's, that's uh, what you don't desire. And I'd like to, to uh, um, sort of set this in the context of, of uh, sort of classical um, uh, risk theory that, that's played a big role in, in what parts of the community have done, and sort of a, 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 a view of, of a way that, that, um, that's, that's new to think about these things, and, um, but I think is very relevant to um, um, the topic uh, that was uh, the uh, last of the uh, um, title of the talk about life. So there's all sorts of different risk and, and failure in engineered systems. And I think that a lot of effort has been spent and, and with great success on, on probabilistic uh, uh, models of risk. And a lot of what's been done in the community has made its way into uh, Black-Scholes models in the, the stock market and, and lots of, of financial instruments. Um, and that's been very successful. What I think that we haven't really fully understood is how you deal with complexity-based risk. And, and so I'd like to talk a little bit about what that is. And here's an example of something that, that actually uh, showed up as, as being an interesting problem, is that uh, early in the space age, some of the satellites uh, uh, that were sent up uh, were spin-stabilized about a, uh, um, a uh, minor axis, which is, it turns out to be uh, intrinsically unstable. And it's because uh, what happens is that as energy is dissipated, that the trajectories follow a natural path on the momentum sphere. And they end up, uh, it ends up so that, that uh, the low energy rotation is always going to be a tumbling rotation. So you can't spin this about its, its, its uh, long axis and, and have that be stable if it's, if it's dissipating energy. And they all do, eventually. So what's interesting, and, and the way that uh, this has to do with complexity-based risk, is that the thing, when it starts out, uh, you turn out to be in a uh, sort of a potential well uh, of one or two different uh, rotations. So the thing can be tumbling either clockwise with respect to some axis or counterclockwise with respect to one axis. And when you start out spinning about the unstable axis, um, the closer you get to a pure rotation about the unstable axis, the closer you are to, to a place where you can't discriminate at all which um, rotation you're going to fall into. So this is an example of, of uh, sort of um, you, you would need infinite precision in order to understand the outcome. You can actually think about flipping a penny in exactly the same way, but nobody does. But people uh, might think about um, sort of two-well roulette. So you think about a rotating pendulum here. And here, if you start this thing out and give it a little flip, it can fall into one of two potential wells here. And um, you could place bets on that. And, and what people do is they make roulette wheels that, that have um, you know, 32 or whatever it is, potential wells, and, and so then it gets to be an interesting game. But nobody thinks about risk in terms of, of potential wells, but you could. And here's an example of, of the thing, and you can see that, that it's very sensitive to the initial conditions, which side, left or right, it's going to fall into. So if you have some dissipation in any of these systems, then there's always um, the risk of falling into the wrong potential well, presuming that, that somewhere you placed your money and um, you fall into the other potential well. And this type of risk actually shows up in biological systems that people think about all the time. And one of the great, great problems, and I think uh, Charles brought people to BU who, who have made contributions to this, is the problem of protein folding um, or, or um, 
uh, protein bonding. And the idea is that, that there are different configurations of proteins that are stable. And, but instead of having like two potential wells, you have something like 10 to the 47th potential wells. And it turns out that if the protein folds up the wrong way, you get mad cow disease or something equally awful. It just is, is an awful thing. And there's something called Leventhal's paradox, which isn't really a paradox, but what it says is that um, it is uh, virtually statistically impossible that it happens by accident that the proteins fold up the, the, wrong, the, the right way. But fortunately, and the fact that we're all sitting here, they do. So um, I don't have too much to say about this, but I think that, um, but there is a lot to say. Because I, and I think that, that a lot of stuff is, is being done here uh, that, that's uh, maybe under the heading of control. This is from the transactions on automatic control that I talked about. And these are distinguished colleagues who are sitting in the room. And they're uh, developing um, procedures for, for, for addressing this problem. One of the things that you can do is you, you can't um, completely avoid risk ever. And, and you know, thinking about risk in terms of falling into the wrong potential well is a fine way to think about it, but you need some prescriptive technique. And what you don't have, and what I don't think you have any chance of having, is, is a way to prescribe which way you're going to force one of these things that has 40, 10 to the 47th different possibilities to go into the right potential well. But what you can do is you can try to bias things. And I think that's, that's one of the great undertakings, is to admit the possibility of, of failure and, and going into the wrong potential well, but understand how to, to uh, bias these things. And try to understand these things in terms of what's the cost. What's the cost of going from one level of risk to another level of risk and incorporate that into your design procedure? And, you know, this is uh, in terms of the, the way uh, networks work. I mean, uh, the protein uh, bonding problem is just one example of, of the way that, that you can think about, you know, all of, of sort of cellular biology now as very complex uh, um, chemical reactions that are somehow networked together. And they're, they're um, programmed by networks of, of genes. And I think one of the, the things that, that biologists uh, uh, really are, are starting to understand is, is that uh, uh, genes basically don't uh, um, typically, uh, that sometimes, but they don't typically uh, characterize what's going to happen in a, a, a biological process uh, all by themselves. Usually they, they, they're, there's some sort of a networked effect, and they all play together. Um, this is another uh, local guy, uh, Craig Mello, who got the uh, Nobel Prize a couple of years ago at UMass, and he discovered one of the uh, mechanisms by which you can um, change the, the uh, way that uh, genes uh, express or don't express themselves. Um, just a, a quick uh, uh, sort of um, uh, thought on, on uh, um, biology and network systems. Um, one of the things that, that uh, I'll, I'll let you read this, and I won't read the slide, but the thing is that there is, uh, at some point in, in all of uh, biological networks, you have to f uh, face the, the uh, prospect of, of failure and uh, a total breakdown in the regulatory system. And I think one of the great questions that you can think about is um, what's the relationship between the, the sort of plasticity and the adaptability that you have in the feedback systems in, in biology? On the one hand, that, that allows biological organisms to survive in all sorts of different environments. And, and biologists, you know, they do experiments. They take single cell uh, creatures and they, they put them in different environments and, and, and watch them adapt. And they do adapt. I mean, it's basically these, these uh, uh, biological networks, these chemical and gene networks uh, uh, that are activated and, and act. But ultimately, uh, these things fail and, and uh, you know, living things die and, and somehow these things are probably related. So uh, just another uh, BU person in the, and, uh, the, uh, uh, who's uh, working in, in, in the interface between uh, network control systems and gene networks is uh, Colleen Belta, who's uh, one of our colleagues. Okay, um, I'm going to finish quickly by just talking about um, um, 
robots and, and uh, uh, sensor networks. There's, there's, there's a couple of problems that we've wanted to think about. One of them is, is things uh, that are related to the data rate problem. And, uh, you know, I gave you the data rate theorem and, and said that, that uh, you know, uh, one of the great open questions now is, is, is coding, uh, with another one uh, being really, you know, how you, you uh, pass information uh, through networks so that you've got multiple um, uh, players, not just a single feedback loop and, and, and multiple um, actors and these things all have to communicate. And another thing that's, that's very important is, is sort of how these different uh, um, data and communication structures have to change over time. And um, one of the things that you'd like to know is, you know, how do you organize sensing patterns and, and uh, motion assignments if you want to have players that are going to achieve some uh, coordinated uh, team-oriented task. So that's uh, the robots and then, all right, so I guess the, the football team isn't going to play, but uh, that's fine. So um, one of the things that, that we've worked on is um, uh, sensing patterns for uh, organizing formations of, of robots that um, um, measure uh, relative proximity to one another, which is one of the things that, that you can uh, clearly sense. And we've gotten very interested in sort of parsimonious data patterns. That is, what's the smallest number of, of, uh, um, uh, uh, of sense data that you have to have? And there's lots of reasons to, to deal with parsimony. Uh, um, and uh, it turns out that there are connections with, with graph theory. And um, just to mention some uh, classical results, uh, there are things called isostatic rigid graphs that are basically graphs that have enough links in them so that if you assume that these are just physical things that have pin joints that, that are allowed to rotate about one another, um, they can, uh, the, the graph could in principle deform unless it was braced in such a way that it wouldn't. And here, if you have four vertices, as we do, and we have these five edges, it turns out that this is rigid. And it's different from this graph, which is also rigid, because here, if I take any single one of the links away, it's no longer rigid. Then the, the formation can deform, the graph can deform. And the, the planar theory of graph rigidity is, is uh, classical, and it's very uh, uh, beautiful because it's, uh, there's a combinatorial version uh, and there's also a, a constructive version that says you can get every planar graph um, by means of something called a vertex extension uh, or an edge split. And uh, these are pictures that, that describe these. And one of the things that we've done is we have um, generalized this to the notion of um, directed graphs. And directed graphs are, are what are used to model these sensing patterns of relative distance. And what we're interested in doing is finding rigid formations where each uh, um, member of the formation regulates its distance to two other members of the formation. And um, if you do that, it turns out that it's rigid. And it turns out that there's a completely constructive procedure, which is even simpler in the case of, of directed graphs. And this is one of the um, um, results that we have. And so what we've been doing in the past um, year or so with students in my lab is trying to understand what all of these sensing patterns are and how you map these into tasks that you want to achieve and what's the, the best way to organize your information flow in the formation so that you achieve your task objectives. And, you know, this is a, a thing that would get uh, uh, fairly mathy, and I think, um, you know, it's, it's late in the lecture, so I don't want to um, um, dwell on that. But it is, it is kind of a uh, beautiful theory, and um, we've uh, um, figured out, uh, in principle, how to characterize all of the formation types, and this is the number of vertices, 
and you see that there, there is um, uh, sort of one rigid formation on three vertices, so you think of three robots. There are three with four, and there are five with 13, and these are up to certain types of, of similarity. But this is, is um, a, 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 a beautiful problem because it's a special case of the graph isomorphism problem, which is one of the, the great unsolved problems in, in uh, mathematics, whether this is uh, NP-complete or not. And um, um, uh, we have uh, techniques to, uh, that completely characterize uh, certain ones of the formations. So I won't uh, speak to you too much about that. I just want to uh, end by um, talking about uh, how this might be used. And one of the things, uh, here's an equation that I will um, leave up there, is just because what I, what I want to, uh, um, you to take away here is that for formations of any given size, there's an enormous set of equations. So this is, is, is uh, something that if you let n get uh, to any reasonable size, you're talking about complexity that's the same as the protein problem, okay? And what we find out, uh, without going through um, a lot of the analysis, is that uh, there is enormous sensitivity to initial conditions here, and if you use these very simple decentralized control laws where, where each robot has to look at, at certain ones of its neighbors and it has an assignment and then they regulate their positions, then there is uh, uh, great sensitivity and you can actually uh, end up with the wrong formation if you uh, are not paying attention. So again, this is where you know, risk comes in and the uh, intelligent uh, management of risk is uh, something that, that needs to be uh, more formalized and brought to bear on this problem if there's any hope of having um, a safe realization of one-third of all military vehicles uh, um, using these kinds of feedback laws. So I think this is a good point to go to conclusions. Uh, control is and probably will remain a hidden technology. Um, there are very few people who are as comfortable about uh, bringing layman's theorem up at the dinner table as they are talking about uh, how their um, BlackBerry work today. Um, network systems are ubiquitous, however, and network control systems are essential to understand both the natural and engineered world. And I, I, think, I think it really is a, uh, one of the things you find in the uh, control journals that I talked about is that they are now sort of a hotbed of, of writing about things that are, uh, go under the name of systems biology. And, and uh, there's just a lot of people that, that are, are uh, starting to think about these things. And, and you know, this is, is, is one of the, the, the best places in the world for people to get involved in this just because of, of uh, the way uh, uh, this place has, has grown up. Um, the role of information in relation to the physical world remains to be understood, and I think that this is, is, is an important uh, point. Uh, and um, the essence of robustness in network dynamics remains to be understood, and this is this idea of, of how you trade off uh, things like uh, fragility and, and uh, of, of the network uh, to uh, um, adaptability. And, and uh, I think... Uh, it's, uh, the future is, is very exciting. So I think with that, um, I will uh, conclude the lecture and uh, thank everybody for uh, coming and, and, uh, and staying. <laughs>
do you want the absolutely maximum uh, degree of parsimoniousness in your in in any information system? And the answer may be no. And, and but I think you know understanding how to uh, deal with that is uh, it's a question that that uh, is deserves research. I a little bit feel that control theory is its victim of its own success in the sense that although there are many, many applications over all the different areas, very few people understand the articles currently published in IEEE transactions because it became up to a degree a field of applied mathematics as well. So the, my question is how to water down automatic control? <laughs> Yeah, I, I, that's, a, that's a question that I think a lot of us struggle with. And, um, you know, it, and, 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 you know I, just, I told you that, the, that it's a very highly cited journal, but I didn't tell you, I don't know what the citations are. It may be people uh, writing little comments that uh, um, they can't make head or tail out of this. <laughs> A new biology journal hits six right away. No, no, the 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 uh, the impact factor is is uh, it's actually not the highest. It's no. it's it's the eighth in 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 the two hundred and six electrical engineering journals. Uh, so that's a, that's a different metric. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But this is why but, because it's so yeah. difficult. But it's yeah, it's absolutely true, and it's I think people struggle with that. You mentioned common filter. I, you probably know, but maybe the audience doesn't know. Uh, three weeks ago, the National Academy of Engineering awarded the 2008 Draper Prize, which is the equivalent of a Nobel Prize for Engineering, to common. Very good. Thanks. There's a question on the back. Two questions. Uh, you mentioned that when you have two uh, autonomous airplanes flying, that's science fiction. Yes. And I do realize that science fiction has become reality once in a while. And I do know that NASA is talking about flying five satellites and formation flying to do interferometry from space. Uh, is that uh, still science fiction over the next 20 years? Well, you know, it, it is and it isn't. I mean, it's, I mean, I think what you said that, that's uh, important to realize for everybody is, and, and you know, it is, is not in contradiction to what I was saying, is that, that science fiction does have a habit in, in some cases of becoming reality and, and, and science. So the, you know, the, the idea of having autonomous vehicles and, and uh, you know, formation flying of, of satellites, you know, I think is, is absolutely going to come to pass. And, and what's going to happen is that, you know, in the beginning, the uh, success stories are going to be ones that have enormous uh, investment of, of design and, and development so that, uh, um, you know, putting up a, a, a formation of satellites is going to be a, a huge, huge effort. I think what will eventually happen, uh, you know, going more distantly into the future is that these things will become more routine and that, that uh, you know, they won't be done as, as uh, one-off things, but they'll be done uh, I I more, more typically. But I think where we are now is that, that you know, we've seen the DARPA grand challenges, and uh, they recently had, uh, with much less fanfare than some of the early ones, they had an urban grand challenge where they had a bunch of um, robot cars have to negotiate uh, uh, city traffic in a, a uh, sort of a, a structured city. And, uh, you know, quite a number of the robots actually finished, unlike the, the first Grand Challenge, where virtually none of them uh, finished the course. So these things are, are going to come to pass. And I think that the, the only word of caution is that, um, you know, I, I, I didn't dwell on, on the pathologies of, of what can happen uh, in, when you try to control multiple vehicles uh, um, to do autonomous things, but, but I think that there's a lot that has to be thought out very, very carefully uh, in the same way that, that uh, you know, NASA learned by its, experience, ex uh, by its mistakes in the early part of the space age where, where, you know, satellites went tumbling when they weren't supposed to. But, you know, it, that's just part of the uh, learning curve. Getting back to your, your title, which perhaps is, is only a little outrageous, um, <laughs> this is probably, you probably described what is the fundamental problem with modern medicine, 
Um, if you imagine uh, giving an airplane, uh, have, controlling an airplane by having a crew of people, uh, one person only understands how the rudder works, and another person only understands what the ailerons do, and another person only understands about the engines, and telling them fly the airplane without a pilot who more or less understands how the whole system works. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's what come of modern medicine, that all these highly specialized people who would understand that all these control systems interact with each other and affect each other, and the specialists don't talk to each other. That's, so so, so some, some of this, of course, they'll never be able to read these, these papers. <laughs> <laughs> Same for energy conservation. You fix one thing, and you make two holes. Because there's no words in the papers. Yeah, I mean it's. Yeah, it 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 it's a uh, it it's certainly a, a good point, and and uh, you know you know taking a, a uh, systems perspective, I think is uh, is something that that probably is is um, there's more of a tradition in some cultures than than others. Yeah. I see one more question. Mike has hand up in the one of the earlier questions mentioned watering down, so this is sort of an ultimate watered down question. Uh, at many times in the lecture, especially when you brought up biological systems, uh, I wondered if you or other experts in, in control theory or in complexity theory get drawn into the, the debate with intelligent design. <laughs> no, you know, it, you know, one of the things, see the, the good side, you know, we, we had, you know the comment that Chandor made about you know that, that the uh, the problem with the uh, transactions and automatic control is that it's inaccessible. But you see, actually, this is somewhat of a good thing too because the the intelligent design people don't read the transactions on automatic control. Okay. Well, listen, we we um. Uh, I'm sure we could talk about these issues and, and the impact of control theory on, on, on the, in the world forever. The, uh, this has been a wonderful event. We worry very much about what kind of venue to hold this event in, whether we would uh, use a large lecture hall or not. And I was thrilled to see overflow here, and, and I'm sure it had to do with the wonderful uh, reputation of John. And so let's thank him again for a great. <laughs>